Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the awesome privilege of being here to study your holy word. We ask that as we study the concept of the judgment in the book of Genesis, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to instruct us. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to understand that we are now living in the hour of your judgment, and that we need to prepare to pass through that awesome moment in time when our name comes up before the judgment bar. We thank you for the promise of your presence, and we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our study today is Innocent Until Proven Guilty. Now it might be surprising to uh, some of those who are here that that's the way in which God operates. It is not a modern concept of jurisprudence. You know, in the United States we say that you're innocent until proven guilty. But this aspect of the judgment that we have in our system of government actually is based on a divine principle that we find in Scripture. Now what I want to do is go through several stories that we find in the book of Genesis that deal with the issue of judgment. And then we will end our study by noticing the concept of judgment in the book of Revelation. And we'll see that the same sequence of judgment in Genesis is found also in the book of Revelation. Now let's begin our study in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. It says there, and we've read this in previous contexts before, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now there are three things that I want to underline in these two verses with which we began our study today. First of all, in these verses there is a moral authority who is God. Secondly, that moral authority has a moral code or a moral law. In this case, it's the command to not eat from the tree. So the moral ruler has a moral commandment or a moral law. And in these verses, God, who is the moral authority, who has this moral code, tells man that if he eats from the tree, the penalty is going to be what? Is going to be death. So you have a moral authority, you have in the second place, that moral authority has a law or a code, and disobedience to that law or to that code comes, brings as a result death. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. Did man break that moral code? Yes, he did. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. And by the way, when I say man here, I'm uh, referring to man and woman because they're both called man in the book of Genesis. It's a generic term. And so it says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Question. Did Adam and Eve break God's moral code? Yes, they did. Did they commit the crime? Yes. Crime is breaking the law. And so Adam and Eve broke the moral code of the moral ruler, and the penalty for committing the crime was what? Was death. Now, did Adam and Eve attempt to cover up their crime. You know, when somebody commits a crime, what do they try to do? They try to cover it up. They try to hide the fact that they committed the crime. 
Do we have this in the story in the book of Genesis? Yes, we do. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8. Genesis 3 verses 7 and 8. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. We'll come back to that in a few moments. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves coverings. And now notice verse 8. And when it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife did what? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Did these criminals, so to speak, try to hide what they had done? Yes. First of all, by covering up their nakedness with fig leaves, and secondly, by doing what? By hiding from the presence of the Lord. And so we find a very interesting process being followed here. You have a moral ruler who has a moral code. He expects his creatures to obey his moral code. He says, if you don't, that will bring death. Adam and Eve committed the crime. And now that they commit the crime, they tried to hide the crime because they know that they're responsible before the moral ruler. And by the way, we're told in Genesis chapter 3 that they were afraid. Criminals, when they commit a crime, are they afraid of getting caught? They most surely are. And so you see the same basic characteristics taking place in Genesis as takes place when an individual commits a crime today. And by the way, before this, Adam and Eve delighted to be in the presence of God. But when they committed the crime, they knew they had something to hide. And they no longer felt delight to appear before God. They were afraid because they knew that God was going to judge them and God was going to execute the sentence upon them. Then I want you to notice that the evidence in the case is examined. There's an inquiry, in other words. There's not a sentence first. There's not the execution of the sentence first. There is an inquiry or an investigation into the case. Notice what we find in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 11. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 11. We're told here, God speaking, and He said, Who told you that you were naked? And now notice the question. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Let me ask you, did God know that Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree? Did He know that? He most certainly did. So the, why is God asking the question, have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Because God is investigating the case. God wants to show us that in the judgment, He first of all examines the evidence. He examines the case before pronouncing sentence and before executing the sentence upon the sinner. And so he says, have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? By the way, what is the action of Adam and Eve being compared with? I don't know whether you've noticed this, but God says, have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat? Are their actions being compared with God's commandment? Is the law of God the standard in this judgment? It most certainly is. God is saying, did you obey my law or did you disobey my law? So the law is the standard that is used to compare the deeds of Adam and Eve. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so the law is the standard of the judgment. Now I want you to notice that God does not look for Adam and Eve and say to them, you ate, didn't you? You ate. I told you not to eat. Now you're going to really suffer for that. No, God comes down, He examines the case, He examines the evidence, He says, have you eaten from the tree? And then when it's proven that they ate from the tree, He's going to pronounce sentence. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13. You know it's said that there is no greater fool than he who represents himself in a court of law. 
Now, did Adam and Eve try to defend themselves as they were arraigned before God's tribunal? By the way, have you noticed that in this story, Adam and Eve were arraigned by God before His tribunal? I want you to notice Genesis 3 verse 9. Before we go to verses 12 and 13, let's notice verse 9. The arraignment of Adam and Eve. It says there in verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Did God know where he was? So why does he ask? He's calling Adam to appear where? Adam and Eve to appear before his what? Before his judgment seat to answer for their actions. So is there an arraignment in Genesis chapter 3? There most certainly is. Now notice how these fools defend themselves in the court of law. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13. Genesis 3 verses 12 and 13. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. What is she doing? She's passing the buck. She's blaming somebody else. Is she really sorry for what she did? At this point, does she have sorrow for sin? No. She's sorry that she got, that, that, that she got what? Or that he got what? Caught. Because this is the case of Adam. Now let's notice Eve. Verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So notice that man says, That woman that you gave to me, gave me the fruit, and I ate. It's her fault. And the woman says, That serpent that you made, gave me the fruit, and I ate. So it's the serpent's fault. Are Adam and Eve truly repentant at this point? They most certainly are not. They're actually sorry that they got caught. And they're sorry about the consequences that they're going to suffer because of the sin that they have committed. But they're not really sorry for what they have done. Now I want you to notice that this crime had an accessory. Who was the accessory in the crime? It was actually the serpent, the devil. Did God have something to say to the serpent, to the accessory? Did He have a sentence pronounced upon him? Most certainly, notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And then what does God do? God pronounces upon Adam and Eve the sentence for their actions. And I'm just going to read one verse where it speaks about the sentence for man, but we know that it happens with the woman as well. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. It says here in Genesis 3 verse 19, God is speaking specifically to Adam, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Is God pronouncing sentence upon man in this verse? He most certainly is. He said, I told you that if you broke my law, you were going to surely what? You were going to surely die that day. And now I'm telling you that you are dust, and to dust you shall what? And to dust you shall return. This is the sentence that God pronounces upon Adam and also upon Eve. Now I want you to notice, once again, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Could Adam and Eve appear before God without fear in their naked state? Absolutely not. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. In other words, they covered their own nakedness. Let me ask you, did that really solve the problem of their nakedness? Could they appear before God in full assurance, knowing that God now was going to receive and accept them? Absolutely not. In fact, we notice in verse 10 that even after they covered themselves, they still feel naked. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. So he said, 
I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Was he already covered with the fig leaves at this point? Sure, but he says, I was naked. He's, in other words, he's saying that even though he had covered himself with the fig leaves, he still felt what? Guilty and naked before God. So what needed to happen? The shame of their nakedness needed to be what? Needed to be covered. Now let me ask you, was the execution of the sentence given that very day? God said, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Was the death sentence executed that very day? Yes, it was. You say, now wait a minute, Adam died when he was 930 years old. How is it that you say that that very day, the sentence of death was executed? Now I don't know whether you've noticed something very interesting as we've studied this story in Genesis chapter 3. You have the first stage of the judgment is really the investigation of the case. The second stage of the judgment is the pronouncing of the sentence based on the examination of the evidence. They're guilty, so God says this is going to be the punishment. And in the third place you have the execution of the sentence that has been pronounced by God upon Adam and Eve. The sentence of death. You say, but they didn't die that very day. Well the fact is that there was a death that day. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. And by the way, the death that, was, that took place that day actually covered the shame of their nakedness so that they could then appear before God without any shame and without any guilt. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and what? and clothed them. Tunics of what? Skin. Now, skin from what? Certainly not from an onion. This word is used over 50 times in Leviticus to describe the skin of animals, sacrificial animals. Now skins, plural, how many people were there? Two that needed their nakedness covered. So you have these skins. What needed to happen in order for God to get the skins? The animals had to what? The animals had to die. And when those animals died, God took the skins and He made garments and He clothed the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Now did you notice that in Genesis 2 God said to Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of the tree, that day you will surely die. Well, Adam lived until 930 years old. He didn't die that very day. You say, well, he began to die spiritually. Yes, but he didn't die in the fullest sense, second death, on that day. So how do we understand God saying, the day that you eat of the tree, that day you will surely die. The fact is that that very day there was a death. It was the death of lambs. And those lambs represented what? Represented the future death of Christ. In other words, when those animals, animals were sacrificed on earth, it was an earthly announcement that at that very moment, Jesus was presenting Himself before His Father in heaven and saying, Father, I will pay. In fact, allow me to read you a very interesting statement that's found in the book, The Faith I Live By, page 73. It's a devotional book written by Ellen White. And she says this, notice, The instant... Man accepted the temptations of Satan and did the very things God had said he should not do. Did you notice that? The instant. The instant man accepted the temptations of Satan and did the very things God had said he should not do. Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, that is those who had been sentenced to death, saying, Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Now we understand why Adam and Eve did not die that very day, because a substitute was found. You remember the story that we studied about Abraham and Isaac, the sacrifice of Isaac, where a substitute was found in place of Isaac? Isaac. 
Here you have the first indication of substitution already at the very beginning of human history. And so in Genesis chapter 3 we have the method that God is going to use in the process of judgment all throughout the Bible. Let's review what we've studied. Was there a moral authority here in the book of Genesis? Yes, God. Like the government is the moral authority. Did God have a moral code? Or a law that He expected to be obeyed? Just like the government has a law. Did God say what the penalty would be if the law was broken? Civil codes have the penalty if certain crimes are committed. Did Adam and Eve commit the crime? They most certainly did. And when they committed the crime, did they try to hide the crime? Yes, by covering their nakedness and by hiding from God. Now they're afraid to appear before the great judgment seat of God in their naked state. Because they know that they're guilty and God has said that if they appear in that state, that day they are going to what? They are going to die. Let me ask you, are they arraigned before God's judgment seat? Just like in judgments today we have arraignments. Absolutely. God says, where are you? Come and appear before my judgment seat. Absolutely. Is there an examination of the evidence in Genesis chapter 3? Sure. Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? God knew that they had eaten. But God wants them to present the evidence in the case before He actually pronounces the sentence upon them. Did they try to defend themselves in the court of law? Was it very successful? It was actually very foolish because there was really no self-defense for what they had done. Was there an accessory that also received a sentence that very same day? Absolutely. Was there a pronouncing of the sentence that very day based on the examination of the evidence? The fact that they were found guilty? Absolutely. Was there on that very day an execution of the sentence? Absolutely. But the execution was made upon the substitute, not upon Adam and Eve. Several years ago I was at Andrews University speaking at the Spanish church there in Berrien Springs. And uh, of course during the day, I only preached at night, so during the day I went to the James White Library to do research uh, on the book of Genesis. And it was really a blessing to be in that library for nine hours a day uh, among the thousands, ten thousands of books on theology. And of course I was examining uh, especially the first three chapters of Genesis. And uh, you know as I read the different commentaries I discovered that the commentaries caught this very point that I'm sharing with you in our lecture today and that is that in Genesis you have the same basic idea of jurisprudence that we have in our American court system. That is you're innocent until the ev evidence is examined and you're found guilty and then the sentencing takes place and then the execution of the sentence. There was one, only one element missing in those commentaries. They all had, yes, the arraignment. In fact the subtitles many times in those commentaries said the arraignment. Uh, you know, and, and, and other commentaries would say the inquiry or the examination of the evidence. And they would say the sentencing. But there was one point which every commentary missed and that is the execution of the sentence. They didn't catch the idea that that very day the sentence of death was executed. It was executed upon those two animals that represented Jesus who was going to come to die for the human race. And by the way, that's the reason why in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 we find a, a description of the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain from when? He is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, it says there. Now was Jesus actually slain, empirically slain at the very beginning? Of course not. But the promise of redemption was what? The promise of redemption was made. Now do you know that in the book of Genesis we have other stories that follow this same sequence? Not in all of the details that we've studied, but the three main steps are there. Which is first of all, the examination of the evidence. Second, the pronunciation of the sentence. And third, the execution of the sentence. Now let's notice a few other stories in the book of Genesis that have this concept that before 
the sentencing and before the execution of the sentence there is an examination of the evidence. This is very important for when we get to the, uh, the idea of the judgment in the book of Revelation. Go with me to Genesis chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. This is the story of Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. The story of Cain and Abel. And I want you to notice that the first thing we have is an examination of the evidence. It says in verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? Did God know that uh, Cain had killed his brother Abel? Yes? What is God giving Cain an opportunity to do? He's giving Cain an opportunity of what? Of, of admitting his guilt. That's right. But God doesn't say, You killed your brother, didn't you? You killed your brother. No! He doesn't accept him as guilty before the case is examined and Cain himself admits that he's committed the crime. And then notice verse 10, and he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Is the blood of Abel crying out for justice here? It most certainly is. So the first point that you have is an examination of the evidence. God is giving Cain an opportunity of expressing his guilt. The second step is the sentencing. Did God then sentence Cain? Yes, notice verse 11. Verse 11, it says, So you are what? Cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And then God pronounces a series of judgments upon Cain. And then let me ask you, does Cain actually flee from there and become errant like God said he was going to. Absolutely. Notice Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16. Genesis 4 verse 16 says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod in the east of Eden. And so once again you have the idea of the inquiry, Where is Abel your brother? Have you done something to Abel your brother? And then God says, this is going to be your sentence. And then Cain actually has to leave. The sentence is executed upon Cain. Do you see the three steps? Now, let's notice another story. The story of the flood. Go with me to Genesis chapter 6. And by the way, I'm trying to make a very important point here as we examine the concept of judgment in Genesis. Because this is the process that God is also going to follow in the book of Revelation. In fact, we're going to discover that we are now in the hour of God's judgment. Notice Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now that little word strive is very interesting. My spirit shall not strive. It's the Hebrew word din. You say, why is that such an important word? Because in most places where it is translated in the Old Testament, it is translated judgment. It's not translated strive. In most references in the Old Testament, it's translated judgment. Let me ask you, was the message of Noah separating the human race into two groups? Based on his preaching, were people making decisions either for or against the Lord? Absolutely. And so the preaching of Noah was a preaching of judgment. Where people chose to be on one side or the other. In other words, first of all, you have the taking of sides. And then let me ask you, what happened as soon as everybody had made their decision? Noah preached his last words. What did God do? He came and he what? He shut the door of the ark. Let me ask you, is that the close of probation? Yes? Has the sentence been pronounced at that point against the wicked? And in favor of the righteous? Yes. But is the sentence executed that very moment? Is the execution of the sentence the moment that the door closes? Absolutely not. Seven days go by and then what happens? The sentence is what? Is executed. 
do you see once again in Genesis chapter 6 the, these three steps of the judgment? You have an investigation of the case, the preaching that separates uh, individuals into one group or the other. Then you have the pronunciation of the sentence which is indicated by the closing of the door. The righteous will be righteous still and the wicked will be wicked still. And then seven days later you have what? You have the execution of the judgment. The same three steps. Now let's go to another story. Genesis chapter 11 verses 5 through 9. I wish we had time to study other stories in Genesis because this characteristic appears time and again. Notice Genesis chapter 11 and verses uh, 5 through 9. This is the story of the Tower of Babel. And it says in verse 5, very interesting, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. What did God do? He came down to what? To see the city that they had, had built. What is God actually doing here? Actually God is investigating and inquiring to see whether they have gone what? Whether they have gone too far. Then what does God do? By the way, does God literally have to come down personally and say, I'm going to check this out? No, God is actually telling us the way in which He operates for our good. Not for His good. He knows everything. But He wants to show that He never pronounces sentence and never executes the sentence without our choice. He's telling us that He examines things thoroughly before He sentences and before He executes the sentence. Now let's continue reading. We uh, stopped at verse 5. It says in verse 6, And the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. And now nothing that they purpose will be with withheld from them. So is God pronouncing a sentence here? In fact, notice verse 7. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Where is this decision being made? Where is this judgment, the decision of this judgment being made? Is it being made before the languages are actually confused and before the tower comes down? Absolutely. God, He comes down and He sees. And then he, in the heavenly council He says, you know, let's go confuse their language so that they can't understand one another's speech. And then what does God do? Does God actually come down and confuse their languages and execute the sentence which He has determined? Absolutely. In fact, let's notice that. Once again, let's read verse 7. It says, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them. Here's the judgment the execution of the judgment, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Once again the same idea. God sees, God sentences, and God executes the sentence. Now let's go to one more example in the book of Genesis before we actually go to the book of Revelation. Let's go to Genesis chapter 18 and verses 20 and 21. Genesis 18 and verses 20 and 21. This is before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says here in verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it, that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Now isn't that a strange concept? God's saying, I'm going to go down, I'm going to check things out, and basically He's saying, I'm going to see if they've gone beyond the point of no return. Is God investigating this, these cities before they're actually destroyed? He absolutely is investigating them. But then let me ask you, was were the inhabitants of the city divided into two groups before the destruction? And was there a closing of the door before the sentence was executed? Absolutely! Do you remember when the wicked men of Sodom gathered around Lot's house 
and they wanted to do violence to the two angels that were inside Lot's house that the angel put, pulled Lot inside and what did he do? He shut the door. Let me tell you when the door was shut the righteous and the wicked were separated or divided. The righteous could no longer become wicked and the wicked could no longer become righteous. In other words the closing of the door marked the moment of the close of probation. The sentence was sure at that point but was the sentence executed at that moment? Absolutely not. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 18 and verses 23 to 25. Here's where things really get interesting. Ex uh, uh, Genesis chapter 18 and verses 23 to 25. This is the conversation of Abraham with the Lord, with God. It says there in verse 23, And Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? What is Abraham's concern? Are you going to destroy the righteous and the wicked together? In other words, aren't you going to make a separation between the righteous and the wicked before you actually destroy? Notice verse 24. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it. And now notice verse 25, very important verse. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Is there a separation of the righteous from the wicked before these cities are destroyed? Absolutely. Are both groups established before the sentence is executed? Absolutely. Does the door close before the sentence is executed? Absolutely. And so in the book of Genesis, time and again, we find this idea of an examination of the evidence, the pronouncing of the sentence, and eventually the execution of the sentence. Now it's interesting that we find the same concept in the book of Revelation with concern uh, of the final judgment that is taking place in this world and that will take place. Now allow me to say that in the book of Revelation you have three stages to the judgment. You have first of all the stage where the righteous are judged. The second stage, and we're going to study these, so, so don't worry, I'm just giving you the concept. The second stage is the millennial stage, where the wicked are going to be investigated. And then there's a third stage, which is the post-millennial, in other words, after the millennium, the wicked are going to be alive, and they are going to see their cases presented before them on the basis of the records that God has kept. Now let's talk first of all about the judgment of the righteous. Go with me to Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. There are several important elements in, this, uh, in these two verses. It says there in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Let's stop there for a moment. At this point is the door of probation still open? Is the door of mercy still open? It has to be. You say, why? Well, what good would it be to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people if the door of probation is closed? I mean, the preaching, the preaching would be fruitless. There would be no reason to preach if all cases were already decided. So when this angel preaches this message to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people, the door of probation is what? Is open, and based on the message, people are supposed to make what? Decisions, either for or against. Now notice verse 7, verse 7. What, notice what this angel says. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment will come. Thank you. The hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth 
the seas and the springs of water. Question, does the judgment, this judgment, begin before Jesus comes? Yes, it does. Does it begin before probation closes? Absolutely. How do we know that? Because it begins when this angel is preaching, the first angel. And by the way, after the first angel, there's a second angel's message, and after the second angel's message, there's a third, and then probation closes. So does the judgment begin before the close of probation and before Jesus comes? Absolutely. Now who is going to be judged in this judgment? The hour of His judgment has come. Folks, it's only the righteous who are being judged. And by the way, where is this judgment taking place? It must be taking place where? In heaven. It's not taking place on earth. God is judging His people where? Is judging His people in heaven, not on earth. And so we find that when the first angel proclaims his message, the hour of God's judgment begins. You say, why would God have to judge the righteous before Jesus comes, before the door of probation closes? It's very simple. You see, God has to determine or has to announce to the universe which people he has a right to bring home with him. And that's why he needs to investigate the cases of the righteous. Because those are the ones that he's going to take with him when he comes. And so those have to be determined urgently before he comes. With the wicked there's no problem. Because the wicked are going to be left behind. The wicked are going to actually be destroyed after the millennium. So there's no urgency with the wicked to judge them at this point in human history. The urgency is to judge them before Jesus comes. The righteous before He comes. Because those are the ones that He's going to show that He has a right to take to heaven with Him when He comes. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so we find here the hour of His judgment has come. It takes place in heaven before the second coming, and it deals with the righteous. You remember Abraham pleading for the righteous? Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? He's concerned about the survival of the righteous, and he's interceding before God for the righteous. Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? God says, don't worry, I'm going to be just. I'm going to separate the righteous from the wicked, and then I will destroy the cities of the plain. Now somebody's probably thinking, Pastor Bohr, this is kind of a, um, you know, kind of a fearful situation. You know, the idea that all of us are going to have to pass through the judgment. Let me ask you, must we fear the judgment? Must we be afraid of passing through the judgment before Jesus comes? Well, it all depends. You see, it depends on what? Well, let me talk to you for a moment about the Hebrew sanctuary. You know, when an individual committed a sin in the encampment, they were supposed to bring a lamb. You can find this for example in Leviticus 4. They brought a lamb. And then what did they do? You, you would understand that they were repentant because they're bringing this animal. And then they were supposed to place their hand on the head of the animal and what? And confess the sin upon the head of that animal. In other words they repented, they confessed their sin, and then what did they do? They slew the animal. Representing the fact that, they're, that they were repentant, they confessed their sin, and in this way sin was being transferred to the animal and the animal died in their place. This by the way represented what happens with sinners. You know we repent of our sin, we confess our sin, we place our sin upon Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ takes our place. But there's something else. The blood which bore the record of sin was then taken into the sanctuary and was sprinkled in the sanctuary which means that the sin was actually being transferred from the sinner to the victim, to the sanctuary. The record of the sin was in the sanctuary. You say, well that's not a good thing, because the Israelites, they, they, they were threatened by having their sin written in the sanctuary. Not really. You know what they had to fear? They had to fear that their sin wasn't in there covered by the blood. That's where they had to be afraid. Because if the sin was on them and had not gone into the sanctuary through the blood of the animal, they would have to suffer the penalty for the sin if they didn't bring the animal and sacrifice it and if the sin was not transferred into the sanctuary by the blood. In other words, the greatest assurance for the sinner in Israel was to have their sin in the sanctuary covered by the blood of the Lamb. 
If it wasn't in there, it was here. And so they didn't have to fear because on the day of judgment, the great day of atonement, you know, God wasn't out to get the Israelites. What God was out to do was to open the books. By the way, that's what the veil represents where the blood was sprinkled, the transfer of sin, you know, goes into the heavenly books. Every time we sin, when we repent, we, when we confess our sin, you know, God writes it down, but He writes next to it, forgiven through the blood of Jesus. And so when those sins come up in the judgment, you know, God, I hate to say this, but God rubs it in Satan's face. He says, yes, I, don't, I, I, I realize that uh, so and so sinned, but, but look, I want to show you here that that sin uh, was actually covered by the blood. In other words, the Day of Atonement had the purpose of pronouncing God's people not guilty because they had repented of sin, they had confessed their sin, and they had put the sin in the sanctuary through the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of Jesus. In other words, we don't have to fear the judgment as long as we've repented from sin, as long as we confessed our sin, and our sin has gone into the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, and is covered there even if it's recorded. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You know, it kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, several years ago when I lived in New Jersey, um, you know, Pastor Finn lived in, he's actually from across the river from Brooklyn. Uh, but uh, I used to take the train from uh, Trenton, New Jersey up to New York because I didn't like to drive. Uh, you know, the traffic in New York City is terrible. You had gridlock all the time. And so uh, I would take the train. And uh, interesting, you know, when you took the train, you'd buy the ticket, you get into the train, and in the back of the seat they had this little pocket and you would take the ticket that you'd bought and you would put it in the pocket and then the, the train attendant would come and he would take out the ticket and he would punch it so, so to show that it was used. Now, um, when I got on the train and I had purchased my ticket, do you think that when I saw the attendant coming down uh, the aisle of that uh, train car, that I was saying, oh no, he's coming down the train car. <gasps> Oh, I'm so afraid he's going to examine to see whether, whether I have a ticket or not. Do you think I was worrying and fretting about it? No, because I had the ticket. You see, we don't have to worry about God examining our case as long as we have the ticket. Now, if somebody sneaks into the train and doesn't have the ticket, there's where you have the problem. And by the way, Jesus told a parable of an individual who snuck in without the wedding garment and he had reason to fear but those who have their sins go into the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus have absolutely nothing to fear as long as you've repented from sin you've confessed your sin and the sin has gone into the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus Christ so the judgment that takes place in heaven of the righteous is with the purpose of God showing to the universe I have a right to bring these people home because they've repented from sin, they've confessed their sin, and therefore they're my children, I can bring them home. And when Jesus comes, he, he comes to pick them up. But let's go to our second stage of this judgment before the second coming of Christ. What's going to happen after everybody has made their decision? Is the door of probation going to close for the world? It most certainly is. Go with me to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, and let's read verse 11. This is the conclusion of the judgment. Notice, God has examined the cases. The hour of His judgment has come. He's examining all the cases of those who claim Jesus to see whether they were truly repentance, repentant and whether they confessed their sins, whether there was real sorrow for sin. When He finishes this work, notice what happens. The sentence is pronounced. Revelation 22 and verse 11 says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Is God pronouncing here that all cases are decided for life or for death as soon as the angels have proclaimed their messages? Absolutely. And then what is Jesus going to do? Is He going to reward His people after this pronouncement? You have the third stage, which is actually the execution of the sentence. By the way, the execution of the sentence is to give His people their reward. Because a judgment execution is not only negative, but it is also what? Positive. 
Notice Revelation 22 and verse 12. Here you have the actual reward or the execution of the judgment. And so it says in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, immediately after the sentence is pronounced, it says, And behold, I am coming, what? Quickly, and my what? And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. If Jesus is going to come to reward everyone according to his work, must he have examined what that work was before he came? Are we on the same wavelength? I certainly hope so. You see, he cannot bring his reward with him to give everyone according to their work unless he has examined their cases in the judgment before. So do we have the three stages of the judgment in Revelation chapter 14 and Revelation chapter 22? We most certainly do. Do we have an investigation of the case? Absolutely, through the preaching of the gospel. God is separating one group from another. Do you have the pronouncing of the sentence? When the door of probation closes? Absolutely. And do you have the execution in favor of the saints of the Most High when Jesus comes with His reward? Absolutely. And so you have in Revelation the same idea that you have in the book of Genesis. Investigation, sentence, and execution of the sentence. In the case of the second coming, it's an execution of the sentence in favor of the saints of the Most High. But I want you to notice that there are two other stages to the judgment. There's a millennial stage, and there is also a post-millennial stage. Now if the judgment before the second coming is for the righteous, the judgment during the millennium must involve whom? It must involve the wicked. Now I'm just going to mention these verses because time is short, but when Jesus comes, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Jesus is going to come all the way down to the earth and set up His kingdom here, right? No. 1 Thessalonians 4 says that He will come and God's people will be what? Caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And then John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3 says that God's people will be taken to my Father's house, Jesus said. Where is the Father's house? In heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. And so Jesus comes, we're caught up in the air, and then Jesus takes the righteous where? To his Father's house. And what are the righteous going to do up there in the Father's house? Well, it's going to be a working vacation. You say, how's that a working vacation? Well, actually, Revelation 20 and verse 4 says that the righteous were given the right to what? To judge. It says, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. So what is committed to God's people who are in heaven at the Father's house? Judgment is committed to them. Question is, judge, who are they going to judge? Not the righteous, because the righteous are there. It must be that they're going to judge the wicked. And by the way, the devil and his angels. This is the second stage of the judgment, or the second phase of the judgment. See, the first stage is before Jesus comes. The hour of his judgment has come. It involves the righteous. It's so that the heavenly beings, the angels and the heavenly beings can see that God has a right to bring these people home. It's not to inform God. It's to show the universe that these people truly repented. They confessed their sin. God has a right to bring them home. The purpose of the millennial judgment is to show God's people who went up there why the individuals on earth were left behind. Are you understanding what I'm saying? In other words, it is to get convince the righteous along with the heavenly beings that God was right in leaving those people on planet earth, leaving those people behind. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 1 to 3, he says, don't you know that the saints will judge the world? In fact, he goes on to say, don't you know that the saints will judge angels? That's the same judgment of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 where it says judgment was committed to them. So let me ask you, are God's people going to investigate the wicked during the thousand years? Absolutely. What's going to happen as they examine each case? Are they going to pronounce the sentence upon each of those individuals who were left behind? Yes or no? Absolutely. When is that sentence going to be executed? It is going to be executed after the millennium.
Does God do the same thing with the wicked? He most certainly does. Now, the final point that I need to mention is the third phase of the judgment. That's the post-millennial. At that time, all of the wicked will be alive because the wicked are not convinced that God was right. The heavenly beings, yes. The righteous who went to heaven to the Father's house, they're convinced that God is right. But the wicked haven't been convinced. So God is going to resurrect them all. The, the, the wicked are going to live according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. And they are going to see the record of their lives. You can find this in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 to 15. They see, each one of them sees their life, sees their works. And they see that their name is not in the book of life. By the way, it was erased during the thousand years. On the basis of what was examined. And they'll see all of their works. They'll see that their name is not in the book of life. And then God will say, this is the sentence that was pronounced against you. And the Bible says that they will say, just and true are your ways, O God. Even the devil will say that. And then God will execute the final penalty against Satan, sinners, and he will have a clean universe. Isn't this a marvelous con concept? I pray to God that we will all claim Jesus as our lawyer. Let's not try and defend ourselves. Let's adopt Jesus as our lawyer and representative so we might pass the judgment.